You know, they say the hardest thing in programming is to name your variables, and they're not wrong. This video here will technically not help you with that, but it might help you to stay a little bit more organized, write clearer code, and understand what things like m underscore mean and why they're used. So this is usually what people see and freak out. This kind of m underscore s underscore prefix in front of variable names. It's honestly not that scary. It exists to add clarity to your code and enables you to more deeply understand what's going on just at a glance. And to be honest, that's important. Now we're going to spend the rest of this video talking about the how and the why in much more depth, but let me just sort you out real quick. M underscore is typically used for private member variables. So like private variables in a class, like here. S underscore usually means static. Now I use this for both static class variables as well as non-class variables with internal linkage, such as this one here. G means global and is used for global variables. Those are the only three that I personally use in C++, but there are others such as C for constants. The thing is you can really just make up any prefix that you want. It exists to add a little bit more information and context. I've seen some other ones out there that actually refer to like the kind of variable that it is. So like P for parameter or A for argument. I kind of made up this U prefix, U underscore for uniform variables in shading languages. And I'm pretty sure I also used to use V underscore for varying back when that word was used more often. And that's the thing, you can make up any prefix that you like because the whole purpose of this is just to add a little bit more information, a little bit more context to a variable. Now people also like to write these like in a different code style as well. In my code style, I write the letter first, then an underscore, and then the variable name beginning with a capital. So the rest of the variable is in Pascal case. However, others like to have the variable name in camel case or snake case, and others don't even include the underscore. They just have like M and then the variable name in Pascal case. Lots of different variations, all with the same point of just adding a little bit more information. So the rest of this video, we're just going to talk about why this is useful and why this is used, why I personally like to use this keyword, I personally, this video is just my opinion. Learning programming is all about practice. You can't just keep learning theory without actually writing code. And that's exactly why BootDev, the sponsor of this video, is such a great place to learn programming. Boot.dev is a website that takes inspiration from modern game design to try and teach programming in a much more engaging and practical way. They're basically trying to make this whole difficult process of learning programming super fun for you and kind of communicate the sense of progress in a really, really effective way. They've got plenty of hands-on practical lessons that balance theory really well with actual practice. As you can see, see here, you'll actually be writing code and changing existing code, which as you can imagine is such an effective way to learn programming. As you go through their courses, every step of the way you'll have to write actual code to implement solutions to problems. And they tie this in with game-like systems to make it so much more fun. So you'll earn XP, level up, complete quests, etc. Their courses mostly focus on back-end web development, so they have like Python, Go, JavaScript. But no matter what kind of programming you're really interested in, if you're just learning, the language doesn't matter too much. It's more about learning the concept of programming in in general, and their teaching style just does that so well. They've also got this bear wizard AI chatbot that you can use to help you out. You can just ask it questions and ask for deeper explanations along the way, and it's specifically trained with their course materials. Just be prepared to feed him salmon. And check this out, all of their content is actually free to read and watch in guest mode. So you can always check it out completely for free. You'll need a paid membership if you actually want to access the interactive features such as the hands-on programming. There's loads more to discover, just head to boot.dev, link will be in the description below. And you can also use code CHERNO to get 25% off your entire first year if you choose the annual plan. Huge thank you to Boot Dev for sponsoring this video. So to illustrate this point of like, you know, naming conventions and variable names in general, I thought I would kind of present this in like three different levels of readability, at least according to me. So first of all, why do we even name variables in the first place? Why not just write code like this? Ah yes, we have uh, a new instance of a class called A, and then we call a function on that A, we pass in a couple of vec3s and a float, and we name that variable B. Okay, well, you know, let's take a look at that function because that should be easy to read, right? Okay, in this file, we have a struct called A with a double A vec3, and then we have B, which is A, it derives from A, so it's also got that double A vec3, but then it's also got another vec3. And then we have a class called C. There's that function we were talking about. It returns a B pointer. So an instance of one of these. It's also got a vector of A's. So of this, I guess, called A. And then, okay, what does this function do? So checks to see if we're within the size of double A, which is actually up here. Okay, so that's static vector B. So that's different from this. And then we, we do this and then this 
A in place back. So I guess that goes to here and pushes D back into... Anyway, I obviously know what this code does. I'm just pretending on it. <laughs> Let's just skip past this. Now, obviously, this is a simple example that I just wrote just then. Even though this code is obfuscated, this is usually something we call obfuscated code. It's still not that difficult to actually tell what's going on. For those of you watching, if you would like to hazard a guess as to what this function is, what it maybe should be called and what it's actually doing, drop a comment below. I think this will be a fun exercise. However, I'm sure you can see that it's needlessly difficult to tell what's actually going on because none of these actually have any kind of meaningful name. It looks like it's just using a random like letter or two from the alphabet and it just makes this ridiculously hard to actually understand. Of course, you can still understand what the code is doing. You know, B times C and in place back, I mean, that's not obfuscated. So it's still easy in a way to tell what the code is doing, but not the meaning behind it. And that's the important thing. What is the actual purpose of this code? What's the implication of it? What is it trying to do? That's where the English language or whatever language I guess you're using, that's where that comes in rather than the actual programming language. You know, I made a video a while ago called like the most important things of programming or something. But anyway, in the thumbnail, I had number one listed as CPU or, you know, computer device, whatever you're programming. And then number two was human. This is about the human part of this because the computer does not care what you call your variables, obviously, at all, it does not matter to it. However, to us, the developers, the programmers actually writing this code, that makes a huge difference, obviously. And in turn, since we are the ones writing the code, at least for now, while AI hasn't taken over, since it affects us and we're the producers of this, then it can negatively affect the quality of our code, which in turn negatively affects the CPU executing that code. So then instead of writing code like this with these rubbish variable names, wouldn't it be better if it was this? All right, check this out. Now we're talking, and if we go back to the header file, Ah, okay, so A was entity, B was projectile, we have game world, fire projectile. Suddenly, instead of this nonsensical code, we have this, and it makes a lot more sense. So this is kind of level one in my little idea here. It's definitely an absolutely massive difference to what we had before, and it adds so much clarity, so much readability, that a lot of people would probably just stop there and be more than content. And this is also how I used to write code for a long time. When I was programming in Java before I really started using C++, I basically didn't use any kind of like M underscore or whatever naming conventions. I just wrote code like this. But to illustrate why this is still kind of not as clear, not as readable to me as it potentially could be, let's just focus on this particular function here. I'll drop it down a little bit because usually you wouldn't just have a single function in the file. So this would effectively just be somewhere in your source code. We have this function over here. And if we look at it at a glance, it kind of, I mean, to me, honestly, right now, it just looks like it's got a couple inputs, like it's got origin, direction, and speed as an input. It returns a projectile. So, I mean, you know, if I need to copy and paste it into a completely different class, if I need to reuse this code potentially in a different project, if I just want to kind of look at it functionally as just having some inputs and having some outputs and some code that processes the data, to me, it kind of looks like the data that it's processing is basically all within this function. And that's a problem because if we have a look at this more closely, well, next projectile index, what is that? That's not like one of the parameters. It's probably like a member variable. Oh, it's actually just a static UN 32t that's all, all the way up here. Okay, then we create like the projectile. We have this projectile pool, which again is not like in the class or anything. It's just static up here. It's effectively a kind of global variable, but just locked to this translation unit to the CPP file. And then we have entities, which Oh, okay, that's inside the class. So as you can see, it's kind of difficult for me to tell all of the different like branches, like the strings, you know, of like, where does this connect to? Where does the functionality of this function, like what is it reaching for? What is it tied to? I guess you could picture it as like coupling in a way. What is it coupled to? It's very difficult for me to see. And even looking at this now, like I've just shown you what it is and I still like need to keep reminding myself, okay, these two are static, I think, yes and then that's the member variable and then everything else must be a local variable, either like a parameter or an actual like variable that was created in this scope. And you might think, well, I don't care about that. And that's, that's okay. I once also didn't care about that. But as you start being involved in more complicated systems, like in my personal, again, my opinion, this video, in my personal day-to-day -day life, writing game engines, it's really useful to just be able to quickly tell what is local 
and what is not. And if it's not local, what kind of not local it is. So to give you an example of why that might be useful for something like this, other than just if I wanna reuse this code in another project and I can't see what it's tied to, suppose for example, these projectiles were fired in like a multi-threaded context. We might have a whole job system that just fires projectiles from various entities because we might wanna process our entities in parallel. Maybe we even have multiple game worlds. Like we could have a game world per thread, like a thread local game world. It's not immediately clear that that wouldn't really work because the projectile pool is actually static, it's effectively global here, and so we need to make sure that we actually manage that multi-threaded access to it and this next projectile index variable as well. Like we would potentially make this atomic and then maybe have this be maybe thread local if we can afford that or we'd have to lock access to it. I don't know that I have to do that just by breezing over this code. I would actually have to go in, look at these variables, understand how this works much more deeply before my brain can kind of make those decisions. It's also potentially worth noting that if you're optimizing things, like you definitely want to know where that memory is. I want to know if it's static. I want to know if it's inside like this class or is it local? That's like really important to know. Now, I do wanna quickly point out that some IDEs or some like syntax highlighters, probably depending on like your, your settings or whatever, they may actually use a different color for certain variables. So they might use a particular color for a local variable versus maybe like a static or a global variable or a class member variable. Like I've just opened this in VS Code as an example and you can see that next projectile index, uh, I'll actually know. <laughs> Next, next projectile index is white, which makes it seem like maybe it's not. I mean, yeah, this syntax highlighting here is all over the place. So never mind. But in some circumstances, yes, your IDE, your tool chain, once it probably compiles everything and knows where variables actually are, it can point out what is like local and what is not local. And of course that can be useful. However, it's not something that I seem to have here in Visual Studio. I don't really care about it, obviously, because I use the naming conventions, but let's just let's just go with it. In the past, I remember having that feature. Maybe that was like in Java or something. It was never really obvious enough to me just that the variable was a slightly different color because it usually wouldn't be a completely different color. But then again, that kind of relies on your like code environment, your IDE or whatever, actually like compiling the code and making sense of it to highlight that for you, which also means it, it wouldn't work in something like a git diff viewer or like if I'm just using fork and I want to quickly see like code changes and stuff, oh, right, this became a member or it became static, it wasn't before. Obviously, whatever you write in the actual variable name, that's more or less permanent. You can't like get rid of that. It's actually in the code itself. It's not relying on some kind of external feature to go in and like decorate things for you. So now let's go from this to my version. So the only thing that has changed here are these two static variables and this m entities variable. Ah, oh, I, I honestly, this is such a this is such a silly thing because it's just such such a small function. Like I don't know, it's like it's like a weight has been lifted off my shoulders. Like I can actually understand a lot more about what is going on here now. Of course. I'm used to this. Like we used to use this convention at EA and I obviously spent a lot of time reading and writing code when I was a full-time software engineer at EA. And it's also the code convention that I of course have adopted for like Hazel and I just use it in like all of my programming basically. So yes, there is that kind of familiarity thing where it's familiar to me. It might not be to you, so therefore it's probably not gonna be that dramatic. But hopefully you can just see why I like using it and why potentially you should try using it because looking at this function now, it's just way more clear. And if I drop this down a little bit so that we don't see the two static variables up here, I know now that, okay, this is actually something that's like static. So the projectile pool is actually external, first of all, to this function, but also it's external to the class. It's just like a static kind of global internal variable up here. And then M underscore is the only thing that's actually tied to this class. And then everything else must be local. As you're scrolling through code and you just notice things like this, if I need to now take this function somewhere else, then I know that it's got basically like three dependencies. It's dependent on this projectile pool and its functionality, as well as obviously the entity where it actually spawns that projectile. That's now immediately clear to me without having to dive in and actually start inspecting the code. If I show you some slightly more complicated code from Hazel, for example, like this like submit physics debug mesh, completely random function that I found here inside the scene renderer class, same kind of situation. I can look through this and I know what is like a member variable over here. I mean, there's nothing static inside here. There's nothing really static in this entire class, to be honest. But as I'm going through this, I can way more easily see and understand like what the code is actually doing and how it's put together. Not to mention that I can also search for these things, right? So M underscore, and I can immediately see like within a function, okay, these are all member variables. There's also 
another advantage of not just having like no space here, like M entities, because then you can't really search for that unless you have maybe like a regular expression or something. But M underscore will obviously light that up. S underscore will light that up. Since it happens to be important to me in my line of work, where a variable actually is, this is obviously a game changer. It also, by the way, shows me exactly what is supposed to be like an implementation detail, what is kind of internal and what is not, because I would only use these for private variables effectively. So S projectile pool is obviously something that is static, like to this class kind of private here. G underscore is an exception to that, because if this was global, I would still have the G here, but I think it is important to just be aware of global variables if you do use them. But this M underscore entities would not have this convention if it was public, because then it's kind of like, part of the API. You can see here with entity position and projectile velocity, they're just public variables that are part of this struct. So in that case, I just have them in Pascal case, which also makes the code, I think, look a lot better. Like if I was to actually access these variables. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope this added a little bit more clarity to what these naming conventions actually are and why they're used in the first place. Let me know what you think of these in the comment section below. Again, I really like them personally in all of my experience. I think they help tremendously. I will see you guys next time. Goodbye. 